passed from death unto life. That's the title. But I believe this is a powerful verse. And just to give you a few words of background, it is given unto us in the longest discourse of Christ in the Gospel of John. And it is in the Gospel which speaks mostly about life. And the Gospel of John starts with life, John 1 verse 4. We are told in him there is life. And the Gospel of John ends also with life. John 20, verse 31. These things are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye may have life through his name. So it starts with life and ends with life. But this is the Gospel also, which is about signs, miracles, circling around seven great miracles. In the first 11 chapters of John, we find seven great miracles. And those miracles are accompanied by what we call the seven I am's of Christ's divinity. But again, we have often mentioned this. Every miracle performed by the Lord Jesus Christ is like a living sermon. It is a visual aid. It is an illustration to show us that what he does in the body is exactly what he does in the soul. So look beyond the miracle. Look beyond the, the, the physical uh, healing. But look unto the soul. Look unto what Christ is able to do in the soul of a sinner and to help him to find God and to have fellowship with God. But to come back to my verse, this is what I may call a gospel verse. The word gospel means good news. But this is not good news from television or newspapers or the lottery. No, this is good news from a king. Good news from the Lord of Lords. Good news from the king of kings. This is how we should uh, really uh, 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 define the word gospel. Not just good news that something nice is happening, but this is about the good news of how a sinner can be taken from earth and receive free forgiveness of all his sins. All. The guilt, the hidden sins, the scandalous sins, what nobody knows, but God knows it. All these things, I could come openly to the Lord Jesus Christ and receive the forgiveness of them, one by one, cleansed, washed away. But there is not only that this is a gospel verse, or it is also an assurance verse. Actually, if I may use this, this word, there is a triple Assurance in this verse. I, I could just, this is not really my, my, my subject now, but a triple assurance. How do we know? If I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the verse tells me that I have everlasting life. That's the first assurance I could have. I have now everlasting life. The second, I'm, I'm passed from death to life. Oh, here I am, doomed, condemned, everlastingly, rejected from from my creator, no fellowship with him, no way to speak to him, my prayers, oh, my prayers will never be heard. But I can come and the deadness is removed and replaced by life. And this is true life. 
That's why the Gospel of John, I should mention this to you before I come back to the, those, that triple assurance. The Gospel of John is about God. It is about the Son of God. It is about life. It is about abundant life. It is about eternal life. It is about everlasting life. It is about death. It is about judgment. It is about resurrection. All these things are expounded for us in this great Gospel. You want life? Real life? Not the life world will give you but the life given unto us by God which no man can take away. And this is, I'm trying to, to if, if, if I may say, to, to make a publicity to, to this gospel because it, it's all here in how we can have fellowship with God. Oh, the first assurance, um, I have everlasting life. The second, I'm, I'm moved from death to life. And the third one, no more condemnation. I should not appear before judgment. Judgment is sure and certain as death is certain. But there is that triple assurance given unto us in this great gospel. Oh, Christ, as I mentioned, moves from a miracle to an application to authenticate his power to save souls. The Lord Jesus Christ has a unique relationship with his Father. Unique, of one accord, perfect unity, perfect harmony. Whatever could be said about, the Lord, about God could also be said about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's very important. And this is why even this morning I said we are Trinitarians. We are not Unitarians. We are not even monotheists like Muslims. We are not even monotheists like Judaism. We are Trinitarians. And without a Trinitarian gospel, we, we, we make God a liar. Because we are saying, in order to have, to enter into heaven, I must perform good works, I must perform prayers, I must give alms, I must be this and that, I may go for pilgrimage, I must sacrifice animals, the blood, and so on. But it is all by grace. Salvation is by grace. That's why the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three of them together, one God, three persons, and could have fellowship with us. And one of them in those three persons, not three gods, God forbid, one God, but one of the three persons of the God had said, I'm willing to go. Men will sin. I'm willing to go. I'm willing to die. I'm willing to perform something which none of them, the billions and billions of people in this human race, will never perform because they are sinners. They are sinners. And none of us could redeem the sins of another one. So that's why God himself must come in a human body in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. 33 years on this earth, but at that age, he willingly, we must mention that, willingly, voluntarily went to the cross. And he said on that cross, I am ready, I am taking the sins of every person who will trust in my precious blood. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. And it is a gift. It is by mercy, the mercy of God. So Christ is fully God. He took upon himself a human body to mediate, to mediate between God and us. Christ is the life giver. I must come to the verse. I wish I could say more before we get to that. But without the atoning death of Christ on the cross of Calvary, we are helpless, we are hopeless, and we, are, we will be eternally condemned. Oh, my dear friends, this world is not only what there is. There is greater life. There is greater world which is coming where Christ will rule where Christ will be the King of Kings. And Christ create, the Father creates. Christ raised the dead. He forgives. He existed before he became a man into this world. But notice three verbs. There are more verbs in the verse, but I want you just for the sake of our argument in the beginning, notice the three verbs. The first one is to hear. Verse 24, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth, to the first verb, to hear. The second verb is to believe, and the third verb is to be sent. So, hear, 
believe and be sent. So the Lord Jesus Christ is the sent one. He is the sent one by the Father, and he came into this world to be the savior of the world for the people who will trust in him and who will believe that he has been indeed sent by the Father. And that's very important from, from the beginning. I know, uh, I'm not born yesterday, if I may say, I know that I can listen, it enters here, we are in Africa we say it enters here and it goes by the other ear. But the, 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 the most important is not even the listening. Or you may listen to things, you do not hear them. The body is here, but the mind is vagabond. The mind is somewhere else. The, the thoughts are, are away from this place. But the worst, the worst is when we listen, we hear, and do nothing about it. That is the worst. This is why, dear friends, faith is crucial. So the hearing, the believing are all important. I have five very simple points according to this, to this verse. Just one verse. And the first one, there is an urgency. In order to hear and believe to be saved, there is an urgency. The second is it is individual. It is personal. The gospel is personal. The third, oh, it is simple. To be saved and be passed from death to life is very simple. We will explain. And the fourth one, to be saved, there is life giving. I receive life. And the fifth one, there is a total acquittal. I'm not guilty anymore. I shall not appear in judgment, but the guilty one is made innocent. So let's look at them one by one for the benefit of our souls. The first one is here in verse 24. Where Christ is speaking, there is that urgency. Verily, verily. The Greek actually is just, amen, amen. Most certainly, I solemnly declare. That's the meaning. Uh, verily, verily, amen, amen. I believe this is one of the, the most known and universal expression. Uh, the, the, the little I know, at least, is, uh, is that amen or uh, hallelujah, and uh, Abba, Father, Abba, at least, are, the, are, are universal words in every, almost in every language and in every culture. Amen, amen, said the Lord Jesus Christ. But the amen, amen is repeated in this chapter three times. And for every Bible student, when something is repeated once, twice, thrice, it means it's important. Verse 19 it is there. Verse 24 mentioned again. Verse 25 mentioned again. So this is an urgency to tell us that what Christ is speaking about is a fact that is indisputable. And it is a fact that is undeniable. This is perfect. The, the greatest truth you can find in this world is expounded for us in this expression, verily, verily. The, if, I, if I may just use, the, maybe it's the wrong word, but if I may use this, verily, verily, or amen, amen, it's like Christ's autograph. It is his autograph. It is his signature. Only him in all the New Testament have used this expression from the beginning of his discourse. Only him. Oh, yes, in the Old Testament, in the book of uh, uh, Numbers, uh, in uh, First, Second Kings, uh, in Ezra, you may find the people repeating at the end of something happening, at, at the end of a discourse or at the end of a prayer, they may say, Amen, Amen, but no prophet, no apostle in the New Testament has ever uttered these, these words in this way, in, a, in this double way. It seems even they are unique to the Gospel of, of John, but in the Gospel of Matthew, you find, I, I must de solemnly declare, or I tell you the truth, more than 30 times. But here in John, it seems this is a, it's really Christ's preface. 
it, 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 it's, it's so urgent and it is so important that it is repeated in so many occasions. But this is important. Why? Because, you know, we repeat or we say amen, amen at the end of our prayers. Why? Because to make a wish, we, to show full agreement or full approval about something which was said or, or even a, a, after a prayer. But Christ does the opposite. He starts his statements with verily, verily. What does it mean? It means Christ is able to do what he said. He's able. Oh, please trust him. Believe in him. It is God who speaks. And Christ, by saying amen, amen, I am able. He's called the amen in the book of Revelation. Christ is called the amen. And said twice, you see it is doubled. It means it is certainty, not probability or a possibility, certainty, and there is urgency, and there is an extra emphasis to call to a deep attention, verily, verily, and Christ repeats that many times. Christ is reliable, he's credible, he's solvable, or oh, believe urgently in the double amen God. And in many occasions later in the New Testament, we are told this is a faithful saying and worthy of acceptance that Christ came into the world to save sinners. So, amen, amen, it is urgent, so I must come because it is undeniable. It is a great fact and I need to believe in him. And I need, I need to believe in him because it is a matter of life and death. That's also something in the verily, verily. Oh, you and me will stand before God, a matter of life and death. But tonight, I come urgently, Lord, be merciful unto me, a sinner. And the Lord will have mercy upon us. But I must proceed. The second step, this verse tells us that salvation, in order to be passed from death to life, it is personal. It is in the verse. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he is speaking to the crowd, but look now, the individuality. He, singular, he that heareth my word. Oh, parents cannot come to God for you. They will do their best to teach you, to help you, to instruct you, to pray for you to even send you to the church, to take you to the church, sometimes even compulsory. But it's like, can I eat for you? <laughs> you? You will die of hunger. So in the same way, you must come to God one by one. It is individual that we are saved. A preacher cannot believe in God for you. The Pope cannot, the Queen cannot, the King cannot. No religious leader can, can come to God for you. But Christ said, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me. I must move forward. The third one, to be saved and to pass from death to life is simple. Very simple. Simple than you think, I'm sure. But here it is again. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me. And believeth on him that sent me. To believe in the sender means to believe in the sent one. And to believe in the sent one is to believe in the sender. Where did I get this from? Look at earlier, verse 23. And it is very clear there. That's why there is no way to say that you believe in God without believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is just an impossibility. Verse 23, that all men should honor the Son as even they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which has sent him. So, very clear, crystal clear, that unless we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no way to believe in God because to believe in the sender is to believe in the sent one. Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians chapter 2, verse 10, 11. Christ is the Lord 
to the glory of God the Father. But I'm, I'm puzzled. Please help me in my perplexity. We are so eager to listen, to, to trust mortal men, mortal men, fallible men. But we are so reluctant, we are so hesitant to trust in the Creator, in the, the God to whom one day we should all, all go back. We are reluctant and hesitant to trust in the infallible and immortal God. How is that? How is it possible? But these are the words, the words from the one who has been sent by the Father, who has been sent by God himself in order to come. And he's telling us only the truth. Christ is truthful, he's trustworthy, never said the word of lie. And he said in many occasions that we are eager to listen to men, but we are not eager to listen to the word of God. Or may anyone among us be found in that category. But to believe is the key. To believe is the key. Why is it the key? I will explain. To believe is very simple and is very easy. I don't want anyone to misunderstand me here. It is very easy, but it can be painful. Why it can be painful? Because in order to believe, you must deny yourself. Oh, look at me, proud man. I think I know it all. Arrogant. I have it all. I know it all. Mr. Know it all. But in believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, I must come and be humble to the dust. I must deny myself. I must, I must swallow my pride. I must throw aside my right, righteousness, my self-righteousness. To believe means what? To believe means that I must trust that the Lord Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. To believe means what? To believe means that he suffered and he died on the cross of Calvary to pay the price for every person who will trust in him. To believe means that he is the only one and there is no other savior. That's the meaning of to believe. To believe in him means that I must rest upon his finished work on the cross of Calvary. Oh, to believe in him means I must repent. What is repentance? Repentance is not remorse, is not regret, is not to have a long face. It is not, it is not even to feel like, oh, now I, I can see, I'm experiencing. Oh, the, the sermon tonight has really moved me. It's not a matter about moving or experiencing or being emotionally touched. To, be, to, be, to, to, to repent means to have an about face, a U-turn. That must happen in the life of each one of us. If not, there is no repentance. Here I am. I'm going on my own way. I thought I have it all. I thought I could do it by myself. But I hear the message of the word of God. Like tonight, Christ is saying, verily, verily, I say unto you. Then that, that sounds the click in my head, and now I see my true nature. I'm a sinful person. I'm doomed, condemned. I'm wicked without the help of God. I will never see these things. And then I cry unto God. That's repentance. And any one of us coming to Christ tonight in, with the same attitude, denying myself, swallowing my pride, taking, removing away my self-righteousness and trusting in his precious blood which was shed on the cross of Calvary, then I will be welcomed and I will receive the forgiveness of my sins and I will be adopted in the family of God and I will receive a name, a new name. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. That's what the, the word of God tells us. So to believe in him means to believe in all his claims, all his claims. No, we, we don't pick and choose. The Bible is not like a restaurant where you pick and choose. No, you must believe. That's why whosoever doesn't believe in all about Christ doesn't believe in Christ at all. Whosoever doesn't believe on everything about Christ doesn't believe in Christ at all. In Luke chapter 11, Christ said, Blessed are those who hear my word and keep it. So to hear and to keep it, there is a blessing. But as I mentioned earlier, 
Many of us, we hear the word, but we do nothing about it. Or oh, the next one, the fourth one, given to us in this text, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life. This is, if I may insert a word there, I know the word is not there. Whoever believeth on him that sent me hath already, now, not later, not one year later. This is why Christians can have assurance of salvation, not based on the good works they have done, but based on what God has said in his word. So we may have everlasting life now. Salvation is a present reality and a present possession. It is good as done. If you have it, no one can take it away from you. If you have it, not man-made idea, because God has given it. Oh, as I believe, I'm given a quality of life that pertains only to God. A, life, a quality of life that belongs only to God. A great transformation is happening in me when I trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that transformation happens now immediately and for all eternity. And no religion will give us such, such great promise except the Christian faith. Conversion is a miracle. Oh, it is not about a magic pool because that's the context of the, the magic pool is mentioned here. It is not about uh, abracadabra words. It doesn't work. It is not about, oh, you want to believe? Come to the front, lift up your, your hand. No, stay there. It is about your heart. The Christian faith is about a broken heart, a contrite heart. I come to the Lord broken and repenting from my sins, trusting in him. Then I receive that everlasting life. Oh, I'm sure somebody will ask me, what is everlasting life? What is it? Do not worry because Christ gives us the definition. In John 17 verse 3, Christ gives us the definition of everlasting life. And this is eternal life that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So everlasting life is what? To trust in God and to believe in the sent one, the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. In a fraction of a second, in a twinkling of an eye, we are passed from death to life. And this explicitly actually tells me that if we are without Christ, we are dead. We are good as dead. Oh, yes, we are not physically dead, but spiritually we are dead. And we need resurrection. But as we absorb and devour the word of God and trust in, in his atoning death, we are passed from death to life. It is like, a, if I, I may just use a, 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 an illustration from the word of God, like when the Lord Jesus Christ called Lazarus, you know, in John chapter 11 and 12, Lazarus is mentioned. And Lazarus was dead. <laughs> and dead means dead. Four days in the grave. But the Lord Jesus Christ came and he said, Lazarus, come forth. Oh, the words of Christ are powerful. So he said, verily, verily, if you trust in me and believe in whom has sent me, you have everlasting life. Now, right now. Not in next year, not, not even in heaven, because everlasting life starts now. We, I can have it now. Oh, I must proceed with the last one. And then, in the same verse, there is that total acquittal. And shall not come into condemnation. Life given and judgment have been given to the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is the judge of this universe. Uh, I, I don't have time to, to expound on this, but look back, verse 22. The judgment of this world is given to the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 22. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. <laughs> but we, you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The judge becomes your advocate. The judge becomes your friend. He's the one who stood. He stood between you and the Father. 
And now he died on that cross. He took the penalty. Oh, dying on a cursed tree. He bared upon himself the, the wrath of God. That, that wrath should be upon me. But as I look unto him, I could, be, and I could receive that forgiveness of sins. But the Bible tells me that if you do not believe in Christ, believe me, I do not want to threaten you. No, that's not the purpose. But in John chapter 3, verse 18, we are told that if we do not believe, we are under a terrible judgment, and that judgment has already taken place because we refuse to believe in the living Son of God. Oh, may nobody again be found in this place. So by trusting in, in the Lord Jesus Christ, my state is changed from death to life. My case is moved from being guilty to being innocent. My record is cleared. The pending char charges, the standing accusation, all those things are removed and I appear before the Lord justified and the best way to explain justification just as if I have never sinned. No lies, no sin, no hatred, no violence, nothing done in my life. I appear and I am received by the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, believe in him. He was judged for us, but he was risen from the dead for us. So full freedom forever is given to me as I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as he said in verse 28, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. And in verse 25, the last part he said, and they that hear shall live. Oh, can I come to conclusion? Have you heard the voice of Christ through his word? Have you believed in him? What is the most thing to whom you are attracted to listen in this life? Maybe we are listening to, to the wrong God. Oh, we better listen to the right God who is telling us how he can save us. What he has done, it is finished. The work has perfectly been done on the cross of Calvary. There is a judgment to come but I can avoid it. Receive with meekness the engrafted word of God which is able to save your souls. Sin, sin has distorted our hearing, our hearing system. Sin has distorted even our emotional system. And that's why we suffer from incurable spiritual rickets. Christ came to cure and to rescue our souls. Oh, he paid the price by his precious blood shed on the cross of Calvary. On the cross, I finish with this, on the cross of Calvary, it's like heaven and earth met. And as Psalm 85 verse 10 says, mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. So at the cross of Calvary, we receive mercy, we receive righteousness, and we receive truth. And we receive also forgiveness of sins. These are fabulous promises given to us by God. Come to Christ tonight and find rest for your soul. Please let me read the verse again. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life.